Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, SAG Foundation Conversations. I'm Sean Miller with Backstage. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. Uh, it's great to be anywhere where there's air conditioning, really. Um, I'm going to introduce the uh, two of the stars from uh, the CW's Beauty and the Beast. Uh, first, we've got Nina uh, Lisa Andrello. She plays uh, Tess Vargas, a no-nonsense police officer with the NYPD. And her co-star on the series, uh, which will be seen uh, Monday nights uh, in, its, uh, in, in its new season in October, we have Austin Basis. Hi, Sean. Nina. How are Austin. You? I'm good. Thank you, guys. Um, well, let's uh, let's talk about that episode. Um, one thing I noticed they were they were down in the sewer. Uh, and uh, and I'm a, I'm a fan of the original series. I was going to ask you guys: is that is that a, a, an homage, a tip of the hat to the original Beauty and the Beast series? Yeah, they built a really extensive set for that. It was actually really beautiful, and I think they kept it. And it was just two or three episodes. We were in the tunnels, and it was great. We did part of it at Castle Loma, this huge castle out in Toronto. But then they built a set and. You just felt like that gritty New York vibe. There were there were like hours where I was like, I gotta get out of here. So it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Half of it was real and half of it was totally built, and they just would shoot it at a different angle. It was literally one corridor that was like an intersection and an entrance, and um, it was fun to shoot because it didn't smell like a sewer and there was no real rats. So we. No. Uh, no. no. I worked with real rats. Oh, right. So I didn't work with real rats. It sucked. So that was awesome. And um, yeah, the, you know, you, you were underwater, so that's a little more. Uh... This, is a, this is an intense episode for Tess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was, uh, Austin and I were talking backstage, and, and he had mentioned that uh, he's originally from New York. Nina, you live in New York now, so you guys have sort of done the opposite kind of transition. Yes, I was actually born in Encino, and my mother is a singer, so we traveled all over Europe for a long time, and then I settled in New York when I was a teenager, so I lived there a long time. And uh, it's funny because I got flown to L.A. to read for tests from New York. It was just like this whole, like, we're all on the wrong coast, but... Yeah. Wrong country. And then, and then we shoot New we shoot York in and Toronto. Toronto. It's like, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, your character obviously has a very strong New York accent. Is that, is that something that, that you can drop in and out of? No, she doesn't really have it anymore. She had it in the pilot. I did a really strong New York accent for the, pilot, like, for the audition, and they thought that that was how I spoke. So, when I, yeah, so then when I go to shoot the pilot, they're all like, yeah, I got the New York accent. I'm like, no, oh, okay. And so then I was just doing it, like just normally. And then finally I was just so exhausted after the three weeks of doing the pilot that I just started speaking in my normal voice. And Kristen goes, where's your accent? And I'm like, I don't, dude, I'm sick of fucking doing it. Like, I can't, like enough. <laughs> And, and they found out that I didn't have it, and it was just this whole thing. So Tess does have a dialect. It's just a little bit more dialed down. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, in terms of research for these roles, uh, Austin, you play a biochemistry professor. Yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that something that you have a background in? No, but I took a, a summer course at Columbia. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> I, that would be impossible to... I just... My whole goal is if I get a couple lines each episode where I refer to some sort of biochemical, you know, reference. I just look it up <laughs> on Google, Google or <laughs> Wikipedia, or I do my research and, and learn how to pronounce it. And uh, I try to say it as good as possible. It's not easy. Yeah. Well, usually in those scenes, there's a, there's a kind of like a higher need for, for the character. So it's not a priority you know, what the actual uh, chemicals are, what the actual process is. It's more about why am I doing this? And, and usually it's to save Vincent or something to that end that have high stakes for the character. So um, as long as I leave the importance in that and the actual what's going on with the character, then uh, I think whatever, whatever thing they throw at me, and it's usually there's a punchline at the end of it, so it's a big breath and then go for it. And, you know, hopefully I come out the other end and people are laughing or something. Yeah. Nina, uh, how about you? Did you go on a ride-along? Did you do any research with the NYPD? 
Yes, I was actually bartending when I got the part, and a lot of the security at the club that I worked at were cops. Yeah. So I did a couple of ride-alongs, which was fascinating. And um, the cops used to get called a lot to the bar that I worked at for some odd reason. And just, I was just always so fascinated with NYPD. It's just like, you'd be outside, and they would, like, car pull up, and it's just like, cops are here. Like, this is the way they would get out of a car. And it was just like, what's going on? And you're just like, ugh. And it's just like, the most intimidating people in the world. But then as you talk to them more and more, it's just, they're guarded, but they have, like, an amazing sense of humor. And they like to bust chops and stuff like that. But it's all about respect. And, you know, what they do is incredible. New York is the most intense city. So yeah. it, was, it was interesting working with them. And, uh, and both you guys have a, uh, have a shared history in the sense you've done a guest role on Law & Order. Oh, yeah. you got yep. to. Yep. <laughs> that was fun. I, mean, I love that. that. I love Law & Order. That was fun for me because it was, like, my first big... Uh, role in a TV show. Um, still wasn't a guest star, but <laughs> it was like a big co-star. No, it's, it means something, you know, it's like, um, but it was on the episode the whole time and, you know, I had a, a whole arc, uh, oh, probably cool. more of an arc than most of the characters on those shows because they have to deal with just the case and the people in the case, like the victims or the, the you know, criminals. I was, it was criminal intent that I was on. So they okay. showed the whole arc of how what you know the, the crime was, and then you know how we were hiding it, and what you know what we were doing. You were a perpetrator. I was totally a per perpetrator. Take off the glasses. I'm a whole different person. Uh, born you know a Brooklyn Jew, but somehow in the middle turned mafiosa and uh, put a neck tattoo on me, and I uh, you know I, I caused some trouble. I was also eating in every scene. I was a little heavier then, so that was a funny part of it. You know, yeah. always a little comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Could you guys talk, uh, this is a question for both of you, but in terms of, you know, building your career up into, you know, landing the role on, on Beauty and the Beast, you guys had, had both done, you know, a few guest spots. Nurse Jackie for, for Nina. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, parlaying those into larger roles? You just keep auditioning until someone friggin' books you, you know? I mean, it's like, it's just the roll of the dice. And that's what's so interesting about acting is that you'll, I didn't work for a year before I booked Beauty, and you just start to wonder, like, if this is even meant for you anymore. And, you know, you do the Law and Order, you do Nurse Jack, you do all the, the small bit parts, and no one thinks you're gonna get booked off of tape, ever. Like, when you're in New York, it's like, oh, I'm going on tape for what? They book you off tape, so. It's just, it's just the grind, you know, and you just have to stay at it, and then sometimes you get that life-changing part. Yeah. And I think, um, for me at least, it, it, coming from New York, it's been like a process. I graduated in uh, at grad school. I have a master's in fine arts for 12 years. Like, it's, <laughs> it was 12 years ago. So coming out of school, you're like gung-ho. You're trying to get representation, and there's a whole kind of ladder of next steps that you, you take, and you want to get auditions, you want to meet casting directors, you want to go to the, the workshops and, and meet people, get on, you know, get the co-stars, get the, you know, do some extra work to see what that, you know, what that's like. And for me, it, when you get those big opportunities, it was like, this is the break. Oh, no, it's not. They didn't cast me. <laughs> okay, this is the break. And then they did cast you, and then, oh, people are going to see this, and like, you know, then the casting directors, every casting director watches Law and Order, you know, and they're going to be like, I'm going to keep this tape and then cast him in, you know, three films down the line because I remember his performance. So it's just a kind of a, a, a you just keep doing it. And it's, I think, a little bit of what's the opposite of attrition, you know, like, so it's like you're auditioning and you keep auditioning and then people are just that you're competing against stop auditioning and you get those roles or you just people out that you that used to beat you out yeah and it's almost like you take this part I'll take this part you're busy because you got cast in the thing I auditioned for last week so now I'm gonna take this part that you would have got if you didn't get cast and now I got cast so there awesome <laughs> could you uh, talk a little bit about you you founded your own uh, improv group right M M comedy am I gonna, uh, yeah yeah, uh, right? yeah so after um, I graduated I graduated in 2001 from uh, Actor Studio Drama School, and we all know what happened in 2001, and that, you know, it, after the events of 9-11, I really, you really reassess everything that you're doing. It, you know, I'm getting up on stage 
making believe I'm other people and trying to entertain people and then real stuff is going on in the world and there's people that do like run into the towers and, and save people and you know do go off to to war and and fight for the freedoms and and so you reevaluate and I just had done method acting and very serious stuff for three years in grad school and I really wanted an outlet for comedy and for like the instincts I had and everyone's like you should be a stand-up but I, I didn't really see myself in that and so I tried improv and that built up into sketch comedy because a group of us that did improv in New York for a couple of years were like we're funny you know we're we're funnier than this this venue and so let's come together use our improv skills try to create some sketches and do an improv slash sketch comedy show where we have a musical guest and a stand-up comedian guest and we did it every Monday for like seven months and kind of got our own audience in there and it was kind of like producer writer director everything especially when you wrote the material you're you know you're up there and it's it was definitely a, a huge lesson in uh, um, endurance and uh, uh, just creativity because it was an outlet and it did get me going into a place where I can go into auditions and I felt like I was making decisions on what stuff I was doing and then I was getting calls about auditions and so if I got that I didn't get that I was doing this show every Monday night and so I could be creative and, and you know kind of get all that stuff out and it kind of catapulted me into going on auditions and, and doing a little more freer and uh, more fun work and having fun auditioning which yeah. is a d difficult thing to do sometimes. You know what uh, you know in between auditions what were you doing to were you taking classes were you, um, were you trying to you know auditioning for theater in New York? Yeah, I studied with Wynn Hanman. He's this amazing, amazing acting coach in New York. And, you know, just auditioning constantly. That was a huge pilot season for me. It was just like, I was just, you know, three auditions a day. You're on the subway. You're like, you have to have, like, the prostitute outfit and the doctor's outfit. And it's just like, ah. So it was a lot. Um, it was a lot going on. Or both. <laughs> or both. This is like, doctor it's by New day, York. prostitute yeah. by night. You know, who knows? Um, so, <laughs> so... Just studying, just studying all the time. Because yeah. that's, you know, when you're not working, that's why you have to love it. You just have to love it. You just have to, you, we would do it for free. That's the funny thing about it. It's just like, you just keep practicing and working. As long as that. someone paid our rent and bills and stuff. You well, know. yeah, I mean. Right, I was going to say, we'll, we'll no edit that remark yeah, out and later. car payments. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a question for both of you guys. You know, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the uh, auditioning for Sorry Night and, uh, and Mandy Sherman, the, the casting directors for, uh, for the series. Uh, well, I've had some pretty uh, grueling pilot experiences, but this was the least grueling <laughs> ever. I literally, I mean, I have to preface it with saying the director of the pilot, Gary Fleeter, had directed Life Unexpected, uh, and he executive produced it too, and uh, he also directed me in a show called Life on Mars that was on for uh, a year, and that pilot. So. I had known, I had previously worked with him. He brought me in. He probably, he set me up for the win, you know, just to knock, you know, set up the cars and I just had to knock them down. Even if, I don't even know if that's an expression, but uh, I did. I knocked down the cards and I got the part. Uh, no, well, we did the scenes and it was like we, we knew that it was a possibility that they could cast me off of tape because it was for uh, CBS TV studios and for CW. So it was the same connection that Life Unexpected had. And so, I went in once, did the scenes a couple times. We got a good take on each, and uh, Gary left in the middle, actually. Uh, <laughs> he was like, I gotta go. I just, I gotta go pick up my kids from, from school. I just, wanted, I just wanted to see you do it. And you know, he left, and we did it like three or four more times and put it on tape, and I was cast and, and booked off the tape, and I didn't even test, which is... What? Yes. That's I, not fair. I know. <laughs> I, I really had some gru grueling, three-year processes of, like two, three-year processes of auditioning for the same pilot over and over, being brought out to LA, flown, flown back to New York, back to LA, and then didn't get it. Uh, so, I know from... Okay, it's fine. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Did I pay my dues? Did I pay <laughs> Sorry, my dues? We're all good. Okay, it's thank okay. you. For a minute, I was how'd like, you what? get cast? Yeah, how'd it go? Okay, well, um, 
I was, I was, uh, I remember going to CBS. I never booked with CBS. I kind of like had like issues with CBS. I was like, nah. And they were like, go to CBS and you're gonna read for this part and they want like a street New York girl. And I'm just like, oh, so pointless. And I get there, I get there and just right before I walked in, the casting director went, please be the girl. And I'm like, I'll try, I, mean, I don't know. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, it is, I was like, okay. So then I went in, I did it, didn't think anything about it and then the next night, I'm like in my jammies, like reading for like some lawyer part for another pilot, and they call and they're like, oh my God, they're flying you out to LA tomorrow. And I'm like, no. Nah. And they're like, yeah, they're flying you out to LA tomorrow. You're gonna, you know, you're testing for the show. And I'm like, what? So then I, you know, went and got my hair done, and then I <laughs> flew to LA, and, um, you know, you have to read with studio, and then you have to read with network. And like, if you don't pass studio, then you don't get to go to network. So like a couple girls got like the pat on the back of like, go home. And I'm like, oh my God. And they're like, Nina, you're going to network. I'm like, yeah. And so then I get to network and I just remember just feeling like this will be the longest flight home if I don't get this part. Like this will suck. And then I got it. So it's all good. <laughs> Yay! Can we talk uh, a little bit about the... That, that's, that is a great story. Don't clap! That is, that, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Do not clap! Um, so, Nina, you have a lot of scenes with, with uh, Kristen Crook, uh, yeah. who is your partner, former partner on, on The Force. Yeah. Um, no, we're back together you now. Guys are back it's together. All you guys are back together. Yeah, yeah. thank God. Um, do, do you guys rehearse uh, separately? Do you guys try to develop a rapport? Is, is there anything you guys do together to work on your lines? You know, I really lucked out with Kristen because, again, it was my first series, and I'm just like, who the hell is this chick? She's probably crazy. And when I saw her, I saw her on the streets of Toronto, and I was just like, we had never met. And I'm wearing my glasses, I'm a hot mess, and I'm like, Kristen? And she's like, hi! And then we hugged, and we literally have just been laughing and goofing off since then. Like, we never did a chemistry read or anything. We just really took to each other, so it was great. Yeah. And Austin, you uh, obviously are taking care of Jay Ryan's character, Vincent, a lot. Uh, yeah. Do you guys, you know, go out for beers? Did you develop a rapport before you guys started shooting? Well, Jay was shooting, uh, um, what's it called, the uh, top of the lake while we were doing the pilot. So. Um, short, short story long, uh, I, uh, I was, I went up for the pilot to, you know, you go up a week, it's a week before for costume fittings and, and, you know, read, reading, read throughs and, and so you get ready to do it. And we, because of the locations we were shooting and night shoots, we shot from like Thursday to Tuesday. So it was, uh, uh, actually Thursday to Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday were off. So we were shooting through the weekend because there was too much traffic and, and you know, hustle and bustle in downtown Toronto for the location. So um, I leave right before we start shooting and without meeting Jay. Like, I haven't met Jay. I actually read Jay, I actually read for Vincent during the table read uh, for <laughs> network and studio uh, on Wednesday before we started shooting Thursday. And uh, was I was amazing. pretty good. Like, I, no, I'm sure. um, Catherine, you've yeah. got to get out. It's, they're really hard lines to say, and you, you have to have a voice like that. And uh, amongst other things, uh, to play Vincent. And so um, I didn't really have it, but I, I tried. Um, the weird part is when we had scenes together. Um, and then Max read, and The did, whole thing was a mess. And then Kristen yeah. and I started laughing. Yeah, it was just a mess. It got silly. But yeah. Anyway, so I didn't meet Jay until the day before we did a rehearsal. And what Gary and Sherry and, and Jennifer did during the pilot was we would sit at the table, other than table read for network and studio, sit at the table and go over each scene, read through it a couple times, talk about what's really going on, what's under the, the lines, what lines could possibly stay, what lines could go. And it's a totally collaborative process. And so we did that again when Jay, and that, that was enough for us, I think. Two actors working on their own material, coming in prepared to, to do the scene, and knowing what, what we experience in that rehearsal process and doing the lines. And you just commit to your side of the scene, and then other stuff happens, and you, you roll with it. And, and it, uh, I think it was just that. And, it's amazing how uh, actual, actually doing a scene with someone, especially when it, you're talking about you know, intimate, dramatic things, 
it, it connects you, it bonds you in a way that having a beer is not gonna do it. Um, because there's all insecurities and there's, you know, you're really being a person and acting, you're playing a character, there's a safety net. And so when you do a scene and it, the scene works and everything is going and the emotions are high, there's an experience that happens that allows, I think, if both actors are open to it, an another level of chemistry that I think was the case with me and Jay, at least, because I didn't need to. I did have a beer with him. <laughs> uh, many. But just just it, one. Yeah, yeah, no, no, just, yeah, just one really big one. Uh, uh, he's, you know, from New Zealand and yeah. Australia, so <laughs> they drink. Uh, but um, no, he's, he's good. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that, that was my experience. It was actually doing the scenes and, and investing and, and, you know, writing the, the emotion and, and the, the course of the scene to that chemistry and that friendship, at least. Could you guys, uh, this is a question for both of you, talk a little bit about the, the production schedule for the series. You know, a lot's written these days about television fleeing Los Angeles. A lot of folks aren't, aren't working where they live. Uh, talk a little bit about just the logistics of that. Are, is, it, is it, you know, kind of a move to Toronto, bang out the production, or are you guys going back and forth? I mean, you know, I live in New York, so it's easy for me because Toronto is just a one-hour flight. But it, it is a big move, you know. It's just if you're shooting, uh, you know, until four in the morning on Friday, you don't necessarily want to go to New York for a couple days and then come back Monday. It's just we move to Canada, like we live in Canada nine months and out of the year, and it's fine because it's such a great city. You know, it could. I've heard of a lot worse situations, so I'm happy to work there. I think the people are amazing. Our crew is amazing, but you move, you know, it's a huge life adjustment. It's not just work. It, it affects your personal life as well. Yeah. Austin, do you want to you you jump in there? No, I think that said it perfectly. I, yeah. You know, that's, that's it. You, you know, you commit, you move, you do the, it's not, it's an ongoing movie. I mean, it's like, it's nine to 10 months of living in a place that's not your home. And, you know, with people you're working with. And, you know, I know some people in Toronto and you try to, reach out, but family, friends that you've made over years and lifetimes of living in New York or LA yeah. are not there. So it is, uh, there is a sacrifice to it, but in your career, yeah, you got, I guess that is the trade-off and, and, you know, hopefully it pays off. Hopefully it runs for however long, five, 10, whatever. <laughs> oh, I just, I didn't, I didn't want to, yeah. 15, 15, no, um, I'll be Canadian too, so. How long has hey. Supernatural been on? Yeah, I know, right, eight. eight. Uh, so yeah, it's um, a little different when, you know, I make my home in LA, so that trip is not as, you know, I would have to have at least four or five days yeah. break to even consider it. And a lot of times with production, it's, you know, 12, at least 12 to 16 hour days every day, sometimes it's overnight. So if that overnight is into the weekend, then it uh, affects the schedule. And also if we get the scripts late, which happens sometimes because of approval levels, and what are you laughing at? Script Those coordinator. are two writers She's, uh, from yeah. the show. So okay. when we get scripts late. Yes, yeah, it's her fault right there in the glasses, She's, the thing on her head, yeah. Um, so uh, no, it's not her fault, she just sends it, you know. <laughs> It's usually someone else's fault. But um, I started giggling. I, I know, I know. They giggled before we. <laughs> we'll send it to you later. Like, yeah. like we get them late. Like, yeah, we're shooting today. We need to. We need. That, we need that scene. Um, but that's how TV is. It's you know, a lot of approval. Yeah. It's a lot of stories you gotta come up with. Yeah. Could you guys talk? Uh, this is a question in honor of our hosts tonight, the the SAG Foundation. How did you get your SAG card? Oh my God! This is actually funny. Okay, I. <laughs> I did a Levi's commercial when I was 10, and, excuse me, that's a big deal. David Fincher directed it. Okay, so I did a Levi's commercial, didn't think anything of it. That made me eligible. And then I remember like nine, 10 years later, I'm like, I wanna be an actress. And my mom's like, oh, okay. And I'm like, well, I gotta get into SAG. And she goes, I think you're eligible from that commercial. I go, no way, called them up. And so I got kind of lucky because some people really got to do some lame stuff. So Background work. Yeah, yeah. That, that's not fun. I did a Sergio Valente commercial in the 80s. I'm just kidding. Um, that's, I dated myself. I dated myself. 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, mine was the, uh, I was SAG eligible uh, for a couple years and chose not to yeah, buy in. No, yeah, no, it was just the, the job didn't pay enough to pay for the union. And I was able to get more work doing non-union stuff and get more experience by choosing to hold off a little. Uh, but it was the law and order criminal intent that was like, okay, if you get another job after this, you have to join the union. So I was like, it was a basic trade-off of doing that job and I paid all my money to the, you know, SAG Foundation. SAG. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, SAG. Um, and now it's, it's great that it's one union now, in my opinion. But uh, so uh, I don't have to pay two sets of dues and that, you know, uh, that there's no division between TV actors and film actors and, you know, that we could be one. Uh, are you guys planning to vote in the upcoming election? Totally. What's going on? <laughs> totally. <laughs> yep. Uh, when I become informed of what's going on, I will. <laughs> I usually vote for the SAG Awards. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Very political. Uh, all right, back to the season. What, uh, you know, obviously a lot of highs and lows for both your characters. Uh, Nina, I think more for you, getting yeah, dropped into a sewer. Drowning. You know, yeah, drowning, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, favorite moments. I mean, what, uh, what stands out for you guys? Um, my favorite moment when it was when Nina got drowned in the sewer. <laughs> You know what's funny but about you that? Were too. I'm just kidding. I'm you just know kidding. what's funny about that? They kept being like, Nina, you can swim, right? Which is just so racist. It's like, yeah, I can swim. And they kept asking me if I could swim. Like, you can swim, right? I'm like, yes, I can swim. And like, I get in the tank, and there's like a guy in there with me, like, you're okay, right? I'm like, yes. And I get into the tank, and I'm like, oh, and it, I'm claustrophobic. So it was the worst day of shooting ever because it's just like you're drowning, you're screaming, and you're in this black tank. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so that was not one of my favorite parts, but my favorite scene ever to shoot um, was uh, the baseball scene. I don't know why. I just love that baseball scene so much. I think it was the dancing at the end. You guys it was the dancing. We were just. I totally... kind of wish I was part of that too. Because it's a comp show, and then it's a love story between them, and I just love. Because I'm on the other side, and so I'm always doing like the cop procedural stuff with Cat, and it was like the one scene where we were just buds, and like everybody in the precinct was out on the field, and we were playing, and then we were. It was fun. It was a good time. Uh, I, I think a couple of spots where there was a couple episodes where I started getting attacked by the beast, and it was a whole, you know. He was fuging out, and uh, I had to come up with, you know, a uh, formula to protect me and figure out what was wrong. And there was a whole couple episodes where I think, for me at least, it got me out of the lab. And, you know, I went, I broke into the police station, and I went, like, all Mission Impossible, took off my glasses, put on a hat. I was someone else, you know? Um, and so that was fun. And uh, I, you know... It's funny because, like she was saying, the show in the beginning was a procedural and it was divided. So I never really worked with her last year. Like, you know, it wasn't until this year that we started having scenes. Oh, I, one of my favorite scenes was our scene in the finale. Yeah. Because we just laughed the whole time. Because Austin and I don't work together that much and we're very silly. So we would just do the scene and just bust out laughing. It might be a problem next year. I was also handcuffed to a radiator at that time. It so. was just funny. <laughs> Uh, yeah. This is hilarious. Um, but yeah, it, um, I got to work. When I got to work with everyone else, like Nina and Max, uh, there was a whole uh, storyline where I got to work with the Evan character. JT and Evan were teamed up. Um, and so those scenes were fun because I'd known these people for six months and uh, I had never worked with them. I, like, you know, wasn't in a scene. And like I said, it's that, you know, fun bonding experience for two actors to, you know, toss lines at each other and, and, you know, come out the other end and still be <laughs> friends. Yeah. <laughs> Which doesn't always happen, but uh, <laughs> thankfully on our show it does. And so, uh, not to give it away, but what, what, what could we expect for the second season? He's not going to be a beast anymore. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, no beast. I, well, I, I can speak for JT. Um, JT will have some romantic interests. Um, we don't know who and in what order, but it, <laughs> there will be some <laughs> romantic interests. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's it, 
second season is going to take the show into like a really new area, and um, I think if the audience buys into the characters and our uh, our stories thus far as individuals, you're going to see more of uh, the personal I think, lives. Yeah, of the us. personal lives of who everyone is, um, and the arc of where all of our relationships together and you know intimately with each other go on from here and um i think specifically i can't re <laughs> uh what Pam, can what's I say? going on yeah, next you know, season you just know. tell them just tell um, them what happens yeah yeah awesomeness just um, pure awesomeness yeah I, yeah <laughs> love it i mean if you say i mean jt gets like multiple love interests i mean that's Hey, I'm in. My wife is the happiest person in this room. Hi. <laughs> I, I'm going to piggyback on that another question with uh, one from the audience. This one's from Abby, uh, and 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 it's essentially you guys have the opportunity to lobby your your writers who are in the room tonight. Uh, what would you like to see your character explore in the second season? I'll take this one first, actually. Okay. Um, I would like to see. Um, you know, more of Tess's personal life, like why she is the way that she is, and I'd like for her to um, love herself a little bit more and get her, yeah, <laughs> and get her personal life together, because Tess is good at work, but her personal life is a mess, and I would like for her to find love and be a little bit more grounded. I think for JT, I'm, and I think this may actually happen, but I've been lobbying for it, uh, <laughs> is to see the see more of the history with JT and Vincent um, and what they were like before this all happened or uh, what happened when this actually happened 10 years ago. Um, like, where were they at? How did they both deal with it? Was it, you know, we talked about it, referenced it throughout the first season, and I'm just, you know, we'll probably reference it again. I don't know if there's going to be crazy flashbacks or anything like JT and... <laughs> And Vincent in high school, uh, just, hang, just hanging yeah. out. And then the musical happens, and JT is yeah. like, Seymour in a little shop of horrors. Oh uh, yeah, don't. Um, uh, we can't sing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'd like to see that a little more of the JT's perspective of, you know, imagine if, you know your best friend went off to war. You thought he was killed in action and then he shows up at your door and he's got altered DNA and he's a beast and you're a biochemist and you're like, oh shit, you know, like how do you deal with that and, and you know, dealing with losing a friend and then gaining a friend and not wanting to lose him again. That's like a lot of, I think, what I've been working on as an actor for the, the first season and it obviously continues because, you know, he was just kidnapped by Muirfield, <laughs> you know, in the finale, so. Not uh, to give it away, spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is another question for both of you guys. Uh, this is sort of a process question. How did you find your agent, uh, or did they find you? And do you, have an, do you have a manager, why or why not? Nice, okay. Um, well, to originally, I, I mean, this is like how I found my first, first agent. Like, you have to do showcases, you know? You just you go and, you know, I would do a monologue for someone in a hallway. It's just like you gotta like you gotta find them, and you have to read for whoever will listen to you. Funny note that people should know: I had just been dropped by a huge agency. Went to a small age, and when you get dropped by an agency, they think you're gonna quit. They're just like, "Sorry, it's really not working out for you," and you're just like. Ugh. And then I got with a smaller agency. And then I got Beauty, the biggest job I've ever gotten. And then the big agency had the balls to call me and be like, Ooh. you know, we just love to work with you again. And I was like, who, who? No, we're not doing that. So you just have to, and I do have a manager. I think it's great to have a manager because agents, it's just, it's just more people supporting you and other people, you know, they have other contacts and other relationships. It's just more people on your team. And it's just sometimes you can't always reach your agent. It's a family. That's how I look at it. Um, well, you should come to my agency because they're awesome. Uh, and they're here, so I have to say that. <laughs> um, so uh, I love my agency now. They're not filming this. Um, <laughs> um, well, I had a manager first. I had a manager for like a couple years before I even, you know, went in to see agents. Uh, and 
What's up? What? They are? I know. I know. They're filming. I know. Um, But I had a manager first, and it was, I went in, I went to this fundraiser to meet this woman that worked with my dad, and she was going to introduce me to a, a big casting director, and the casting director was running this charity, and I went in, and she was so busy with the charity, she was running around. I said, hi, 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 and that was it. <laughs> and I never, I never met her until I was working with the charity and, um, and sat at a table that night at the, uh, the event with my present manager and their uh, associate. And, uh, and so through that, and they were interested already, and it's like, you know, where'd you go to school? I went to actor studio drama school. Um, and I started coming in. He's like, what do you, he's like, come in this next week with auditions. He's like, what are you going to do? And I, I was like, I don't know. And I started throwing out monologues that I had known from, <laughs> from you know, acting school. And you, you learn like five to 10 monologues that you go you use in voice class, you use in acting class. And so I came out of school with monologues and I did that. And then he started um, bringing me in and, and giving me uh, uh, sides that, of parts that were already cast and TV and film. And so I was reading for these parts and coming into him as if I was auditioning. So it was almost like a workshop class. And I feel like with a manager, there's a, you know, they, they have less clients, a little more personal touch, but they don't do the brass tacks. Some do, but they don't do the thing of getting you the job, getting you the, you know, the contract. And the, the money. The money. Well, the money, but it's also getting you in the room and, right. and fighting for you and, and um, you know, supporting you with appointments. Um, and for a while, that's, I just had a manager, so it was only really two people working for me. And so um, after I did, I did a pilot, let's say, I think it was that's a long time ago. <laughs> it was like eight years ago. Um, that just blew my mind. But uh, uh, I did a pilot in L.A., and my manager flew out on his own dime and said, you know, it's time I think we should try to get an agent. And I met with, you know, five, six, ten agents in L.A. Um, with the idea that I would move out after the pilot got picked up or didn't. And, um, and that's how I have my agent. I've had the same agent since, you know, 2006, seven or eight years. So. Uh, here's a quick fire question for you guys from uh, Colleen Ann Brawl. Uh, she asks, uh, what is the one thing you know now that you would, uh, that uh, you wish you knew when you first got started? Oh my God. Uh, oh, that's so general and so specific at the same time. Um, what's that? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Um, ask it again, <laughs> ask it again. I'm not gonna think about it. Um, the, 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 wait, one, the, yes, the one I, thing I know. you know now that you could, if you could travel back in time, that's the, that's the question. I, uh, I feel like um, and my, when I left school, all the third year acting teachers sit with every one of the graduates in a room and they kind of assess you. And it, you know, it happens at a lot of drama schools and they, they talk about where you are, where you were, and where you need to go. And one of my acting teachers said, um, uh, he said, you got to learn to work slow quicker. Um, and so that's really hard because I didn't realize how real that advice was because until you get to a pilot season and you get a script and sides, six to 10 pages that you have to memorize and put on its feet in three hours. And so, um, and it happens with us. It's like, if you get a script late or you get a rewrite of a scene the night before and you have to work six in the morning the next morning, there's, you don't wanna sacrifice your process and skip steps, but you wanna get it down and auditioning helps get it down to a, a, a like sharp enough science that you can go through every step, but just do it a little quicker, but not rush, like not rush what you need to do to absorb the material and make it, you know, come alive. And so that would be my advice again, but to actually take the advice and to do that and, you know, just because it's, especially with TV, but with auditions, a lot of times, most of the time you get less than 24 hours or 24 hours. And then 24 hours later, you're doing the role on TV or, you know, 48 hours. It's, they cast it on a Monday and, I mean, on a Friday and you're working Monday. And so I would say just, you know, learn to uh, work uh, slow, quicker. Nina, do you want to weigh in on this? Follow that. Oh, jeez. Uh, what he said. 
Um, no, um, I would say that I think um, you have to really have an understanding that you'll never have all the answers as an actor, never. Like, for me, it's just always a learning process, and you have to understand that it's, you have to love it, and you have to um, be willing to fall on your face a lot and make a lot of mistakes and keep getting up, but you have to accept that it kind of is out of your control and you have to just go with it and just trust it and really, really have a, a genuine curiosity about humanity. If, does that make sense? It makes sense that to was my deep. head. That was, no, no, I agree. Um, yeah. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, we've got one from uh, Amy Kaczynski. She asks. Where is Amy? I'd like to see Amy. the people. Hi. Hi. There she is. The Twitter divide is uh, eliminated. Where's Lee Gardner? Nice. Hi. Hi. We have some Twitter fans. I just want to see them in person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we call them beasties. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hashtag. Hashtag yeah. beasties. Hashtag beasties. Yeah. Uh, so, so Amy asks, uh, what are the differences between you and your characters? And uh, what characteristics did you give your characters? that are completely different from yourself? Tess is a lot more serious than I am. She's a lot more serious, she's a lot cooler. Um, I'm such a dork, like it's in my DNA. So it can't help but just a little dorkiness comes out sometimes in Tess, a little bit of spastic energy comes out. Um, and I will actually give myself a compliment. I think I'm a really good friend and that was important in putting in Tess because that is like the whole that's the foundation of her relationship with Kat, is like she has to be the best friend you could ever dream of having, so that's it. Um, I think with uh, me and JT is, I'm kind of like laid back and you know, <laughs> I'm not high stress and it's, I mean, I feel like it's a, you know, not a defense, but you grow up and you deal with whatever obstacles come in your way and you develop a, a, a system to work with those things. And to, you know, so for me it was humor and to, to be, uh, to not stress out about the bigger things. I freak out when I'm in traffic or like when I can't, you know, get my pants on right or like little things like. One leg at a time, Austin. No, like the, the leg won't go down and you know, like I, like. You know, ask anyone that knows me intimately like that. And it's like little things like that piss me, like, I don't want to go crazy, but it's like they get me angry. But because the bigger things you can't really help, and, um, you know, you come to crossroads and you get to points where you have, whether it's like a death in the family or, um, you know, things of that nature where it's highly impactful emotionally and and life changing wise that I, I've tried to learn to deal with that and roll like, and, and kind of, okay, try to deal with it as, as objectively as possible and then, you know, move forward. So I think my, my biggest difficulty with JT is getting rid of all that and, and trying to not like think the worst first. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic as Austin and, you know, very positive and, JT is not, and he's, he's the first worst thing he'll think of, and so, and that energy of the freneticism is sometimes I, like, run around and, you know, like, I sweat anyway just peeling an orange, or, uh, so, to, to, that's a Kevin, Kevin James joke, sorry, it was, it was for my brother, um, but, uh, it, it, when, when I'm playing in a scene and he's, like, stressed out, I, don't want to fake it, you know, like, I don't want to be like, oh, I'm nervous and I'm shaking, and um, so I run around and, and get out of breath and sweaty and, and drink some coffee or do some push-ups. I, I don't do as many push-ups as Jay before, so he's, every take of every scene, he does push-ups or, like, curls um, or, you know, like, crunches, um, but... He does those really hard, like, diamond push-ups. Yo, don't blow oh, up Jay's spot right now. No, no, don't, no, no. no, he's not Sorry. here to defend um, himself. Yeah, so that's what I do. That's the biggest difference. And, and so it's fun as an actor to try to, you know, find things that make me like that, like being stuck in traffic or, you know, some bigger things. And to, uh, for me at least, it was to give 
I mean, he gets funny lines, and he's a, he's a wise ass, but there was a transition where he had to, uh, halfway through the first nine episodes, where he starts dealing with Catherine more. And so I, I was very adamant about making sure that it wasn't the same thing every episode, that even though I got lines that were like, wise ass line that they, they were like laid in with uh, um, a sensitivity and a, and a loyalty and, and honestly, you know, a love for Vincent and uh, his best friend. So everything was for that. And so you try to put all those things together and, and give the character a little more humanity than is written in a wise ass line that makes people laugh. But if you keep doing those like brusque, you know, lines like we get, um, and don't put the friendship, the, you know, the, the, the risk and the, the stakes in there, then it's just, it, I think it would get annoying after a while. Um, and so you try to lay in a little more three-dimensional aspect to it. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. Uh, awesome basis. Uh, uh, Nina Lissandrello. Lissandrello. Uh, two of the stars of uh, CW's uh, Beauty and the Beast. It's on uh, Mondays starting in October, the new season. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.